so let's go now to one of the applications uh, that is quite cool in terms of three term metalogs. And that is that we can do a special case, which is sums of non identically distributed uh, uncertainties. And uh, how would we do that? Well, first of all, there, there are a wide range of, of applications for such things. Um, you know, portfolio value, as I showed uh, in my previous example with the FDIC, as the, as the sum of uncertain assets. That's a big deal. Uh, project management, the time to completion as the sum of uncertain times for various sequential tasks. Um, business development, uh, bidding a fixed price for a contract comprised of uncertain, non-identically distributed task costs. When I did the FDIC bidding problem, I didn't have the three, what I'm going to show you now. This is new information that is not has not yet been published. It's not in the 2016 paper. Uh, failure analysis. You know, the, the, one, in fact, one, one person working uh, in, a, in a military context uh, sent in this example. He said, you know, this is a perfect application for time to helicopter blade failure as the sum of the time from crack initiation and, uh, and crack propagation. And he has probability distributions over crack initiation and, and crack propagation based on empirical data. So most of these problems typically require simulation because the mathematical solution, even if it's a convolution, is, is pretty much intractable. Um, we've shown previously that, that the simulation results can be flex flexibly represented by a metalog, but what's new is the three-term metalog provides a simple closed form calculation that captures the mean variance and skewness of the sum without simulation, and it captures that exactly. So that's what I'm going to show now. I'm going to make my pointer back into a laser pointer. OK, now, so let's go for this. OK, what have we got here? Well, um, the, the, the overall method is to find the mean, variance, and skewness of the sum by summing the respective means, variance, and skewnesses of the uncertainties, whatever uncertainties that you have that you're trying to sum. Now, this is not a new theorem or anything with respect to me. This is a long, well-known aspect of the statistics of probability distributions, which is um, the mean, variance, and skewness of the sum is the sum of the respective means, variance, and skewnesses uh, if those uncertainties are independent. And if they're not independent, I'll show you what the extension is in just a moment. But basically, what we're going to do is we're going to sum the means, variance, and skewnesses of the uncertainties. We're going to parameterize a three-term metalog by mean, variance, and skewness instead of by data. And then we can now represent the mean, the, uh, the metalog probability distribution over the sum. Now, as you know, the three-term metalog is uniquely determined by its coefficients. If you have the coefficients, you have that metalog exactly. And, and the same thing is true with bounded and semi-bounded metalogs if you have the upper and lower bounds. But, but for here, we're just going to work on the uh, unbounded metalog because the unbounded metalog has mean variance and skewness as I showed last time in closed form. These moments are closed form. In other words, if you have these A coefficients, A1, A2, and A3, you can get, according to these equations, the mean, variance, and skewness exactly in closed form, OK? Now, what we didn't know until a couple of years ago is that it's possible to solve. This is a cubic set of equations in these A coefficients, as you can see. Um, if you were to say, given mean, variance, and skewness, can I solve? Suppose these are given known quantities. Can I solve this back? for a, a unique set of A coefficients, the answer is yes. There's a lot of work that has gone into, particularly on my part, <laughs> in, it has gone into actually finding the uh, solution to this cubic set of equations and making sure that it, that solution is unique. Uh, and it is. Um, it, you know, and, and the imaginary parts to this uh, solution are, are completely irrelevant. And so this works. Basically, if you have the mean, the variance, and the skewness, using these equations, you can get the coefficients in closed form. All right. Now, and, and that becomes important. And, and furthermore, we can go both ways. Obviously, if you, have, if you have these coefficients, you can go back and get the mean, variance, and skewness. There is also a standard. Uh, there is also uh, the feasibility constraint is expressible now in terms of uh, uh, mean variance and skewness, and particularly the standardized skewness, which is the 
skewness itself divided by uh, variance of the three halves that's the same as the standard deviation cubed. That's the standardized skewness. The absolute value of that number needs to be less than 2.07 for feasibility. If it's greater than that, then it's infeasible. Um, then it's an infeasible three-term metalog. But if it's so long as it's within that range, about the skewness of the exponential distribution, then uh, then it all works fine. Now let's go through an example of this. Here's a simple example. And uh, this one uh, example is actually suggested by Phil, and we just kind of made it into a real example. The numbers here are completely hypothetical. I made them up. Uh, but they're intended to be illustrative of a situation where you're bidding on a fixed price. You, you have to bid on a fixed price contract. And, uh, and you'd like to take into account the, uh, and, and well, and the work scope for this contract consists of three tasks and each task is uncertain. So you'd start off in the three term metalog world by, uh, by, by coming up with the, let's say the 10, 50, 90 quantiles, which in this case uh, are 30, 55 and $100 million say for task one, 40, 60 and $110 million for task two, 50, 75, and 150 million for task three. And that corresponds um, just through the basic metalog equations uh, to these set of A coefficients, where again, A1 is always the median, um, which is here. Uh, that's A2 and A3. That corresponds to these three curves here. I made them right skewed because frequently costs uh, tend to be skewed right. You're, you're probably in most organizations, maybe not Lockheed Martin, but in most organizations, it's more likely to exceed estimated costs or the average of costs than it is uh, to come in uh, below those costs. And so these three distributions represent that. And these are the associated CDFs of those three distributions parameterized in this way. And then a natural thing to do would be to go ahead and do the simulation as I did for the FDIC example of if, if you assume independence, it's quite easy to simulate from these three things. And, and the simulation of the sum, that is the simulation of the total cost for 10,000 simulations is this curve right here, which is also skewed. Um, and, and that corresponds to this histogram right here. Now, how would we do this without simulation in closed form according to the equations that I just showed you? Well, first thing you'd do is you'd use the, use the equations I just showed you to, to convert your A1, A2, and A3 into a mean variance and skewness. And then you can always calculate a standardized skewness. And this is the number that needs to be less than 2.07 uh, in order for the metalog to be feasible. You can see all these uh, metalogs are feasible. And and if you calculated then the moments of the sum as being the sum of the moments uh, for these mean variance and skewness, so this 2.217 is the sum of these three. The variance is the, for independent uh, variables is the sum of the variances and the skewness is the sum of the skewnesses. And this is an exact relation. It's a, it's a fundamental, uh, uh, fundamental theorem in effect in probability. Um, it's nothing new with what I'm doing, but if you assume independence, uh, the mean variance and skewness uh, of the sum is the respective sum of the mean variance and skewness. Well, what does that enable us to do with the metalog equations that I just showed you? Well, from this, we can calculate the, uh, the metalog coefficients of the sum. Uh, and, and therefore, we can parameterize the metalog with these coefficients and a metalog parameterized with those coefficients, of course, reflect back the exact mean variance and skewness exactly. And then we can compare what is that curve, this metalog parameterized by these coefficients, metalog of the sum, what does that look like compared to the metalog assuming, um, uh, uh, compared to the simulation assuming independence and you can see you get a very similar shape. Um, this shape is not going to be exact except in the aspect that it preserves the mean variance and skewness of the sum exactly. There could be high order moment, moments of the sum that are not preserved, 
but it will preserve the mean variance in skewness exactly. So if you're satisfied with that uh, level of detail in your representation, then this nice closed form formulation, which could easily be done even on a spreadsheet. And I, fact, I, I think actually Sam has a spreadsheet that he might be able to distribute to you all that, that does uh, this kind of calculation in closed form. Um, uh, but anyway, it, it's easily done on a spreadsheet. So now, now the question, you know, a typical question that would arise is, well, wait a minute, what if these costs are not independent? Um, maybe, you know, if, if you have a higher cost on tax, ta ta higher cost on task one, you're more likely to have a higher cost also on task two, and maybe even also on task three. So could we deal with that in closed form? Uh, and the answer is yes, we do have a formulation for doing that. And uh, that's what I'm going to show you now. So, but anyway, before I go there, what I, I do want to say is once you have this metal log over total cost, um, it allows you to, to, answer, to provide some information, which, which is back to your original decision, which is how much should we bid? Uh, for this uh, fixed price contract. And if you, if for example, you wanted to, excuse me for a second here. Okay, for example, if you wanted to say, what is the chance of whatever, that is, what is the chance of costs exceeding 300 million for the sum of these costs? 300 million is about here. Well, that's about 10% with these assessments. But you might also ask the question the other way around, what bid would we make if we wanted to make a bid where the chance of costs exceeding that bid is less than 10%? So in other words, there's a less than 10% chance that we'll fail to make a profit. The answer for this particular set of parameters is 299 million, all right? But now, you know, your question is, but you know, that's, that's assuming independence. You know, what, what if these costs are correlated in some way? So let's take a look at that now. And this is extending this same bidding analysis with non-independent costs uh, in closed form. So I'm gonna start with some assessments here. Now the assessments are, these are the same 10, 50, 90 quantiles of the marginal costs over the tasks that I had before. There's no change at all in these numbers. But now I'm going to allow you to specify in addition a correlation matrix. Now this correlation matrix, if all of these rows, which is the correlation coefficient, if, the, if this row was zero, then the, whole co then the correlation coefficient would just have ones on the diagonals and zeros elsewhere. And that would correspond to the case of independence. For any positive number row, uh, like 25% or something, then these non-diagonal elements uh, come into play. Now I just arbitrarily said that if row, let's say, let's say row uh, between the first and second cost are 50% correlated. And I said for just illustration purposes that the, that the correlation coefficient between task one and three is the square of that uh, 25% or 50% squared, which would be 25%. But actually that's not a limitation of this method. You could stick in any uh, any rows you wanted, the correlation between tasks one and two could be different than the correlation between uh, tasks two and three, and that could be different than the correlation between tasks one and three. I just put in these numbers. I, I just made it a function of a single correlation coefficient just for ease of uh, illustration. Now, well, what can we do? Bear in mind though, Tom, not all correlation matrices are feasible, right? So you have to have something that makes sense in the real world. They're, they're oh yeah. Yeah, you'd have to you'd have to have a legal correlation matrix. Um, absolutely. Um, so, in in any case, the uh, next what's the next calculation you would do given this information? Well, we still have the same uh, marginal metalog distributions, um, but now we're going to try to look at at, 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 at at the sum of a joint metalog that has uh, this core this this uh, correlation. Well, the marginal, the marginal variance is one of the things that is easily calculated. In fact, this is the same as what we saw before, given these A coefficients for task one and task two and task three. And given that you know the marginal variance, what you know is there's a covariance matrix that has these marginal variances 
on the diagonal of that covariance matrix exactly. And you know that all the off diagonal elements are calculated as the square root of this, like this one here, is the square root of this number times the square root of this number times the row, which is the correlation coefficient. And that's, that's an exact relationship from statistics. So there's not, nothing uh, particularly fancy about that. But what it does is it gives us now a covariance matrix based on simply an assessment of your uh, correlation coefficient. Well, why is the covariance matrix so important? Well, because of this theorem, for correlated random variables, the variance of the sum is the sum of the elements of the covariance matrix. And again, that's a result from statistics. It's not new uh, with me or Sam, uh, but it's, it's just a fact. Um, and so, you know, we could, we could then calculate the uh, covariance of the sum as the sum of all of the elements of this covariance matrix. So this particular covariance matrix is illustrated with this row uh, equal to 0.05. And for this row equal 0.05, the sum of these elements is 6715.66. And we can do that now for different rows. If you have a row of zero, then you've got the same mean variance and skewness as you had in the independent case. That's these numbers and these numbers on the diagonal with zeros otherwise. If you had, if you said the costs are highly correlated, um, like 90% correlated, then in all these cases, the mean is the same, but the variance, as you can see, uh, ends up increasing almost by a factor of, you know, here, here it doubles, here it almost doubles again and the skewness also increases. I've made the additional assumption, by the way, that the standardized skewness is about the same um, when you add the correlation coefficients. There is a more detailed version of this where you could do a, 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 a skewness matrix. It's actually three-dimensional in this case. It would be a skewness tensor and you could add the skewnesses all together uh, and, and get the skewness of the sum that way. But this, I think, is, is I, I've done a little sensitivity to that. It doesn't make a lot of difference. And so I decided to keep it simple for this example. In any case, um, you have the mean variance and skewness of the sum now. So now the question is, well, what does that look like? How, how different, you know, if you believe these are correlated, you know, ultimately you want to ask, if you believe these things were correlated, how different would your bids be? Would you modify your bids? If so, how much at all? How much would you modify them by? So if we take that, uh, that set and parameterize uh, your metalog over the sum with those, uh, with those, in those three cases, you can see that the row equals zero case, that's the same one that you saw before for independence. But it's a fatter distribution, as you can see over here on the right, if you have, it's a fatter distribution, as you can see over here on the right, if you have a uh, correlation. And that, that's not surprising because if one cost is high, then the other costs tend to be high with a correlation of 0 0.05. And if, and if correlation is very high, then of course you're gonna get a wider distribution yet. This is what the shape of these actually are. And now you can ask uh, the questions that you would ordinarily be asking here, you know, what's the chance of whatever? Um, what's the chance of costs exceeding 300 million, for example? Well, in the independent case, the chance was just 10%. In the, if you have 50% correlation, now the chances are like 14% of, of, of uh, exceeding 300. And if you had a 90% correlation, uh, the, uh, the costs are like, uh, 18, or I'm sorry, the probability is about 18% of exceeding 300 million. And then what, the other way around, if your boss or somebody says, management says, well, wait a minute, tell me what I would, what we would have to bid in order to the cost of, the chance of the total cost exceeding that bid is less than or equal 10%. Well, the answer, answer as we saw before, if they're independent was around 299 million. But if, if those costs are correlated, you'd need to up your bid to like 326. And if they're strongly correlated, maybe 350 is a better number. So those are the, um, that's, that's how, and, and notice that all this is in closed form now. 
Um, none of this required simulation. This can be done on a spreadsheet. Um, and, and you just, you know, create your little bidding spreadsheet and, and, and stick in your appropriate numbers, play around with them in order to get some, uh, some ballpark insight as to what uh, correlated costs might do. Um, the, the process I've shown uh, is, pretty, is pretty straightforward, but I just want to make, make sure that everybody understands that, you know, the, the first step is provide marginal mean variance and skewness of the uncertainties to be some. These can be metalogs, as I showed, but they can also be from any other distribution. They could be from a log number distribution or even a discrete distribution, so long as the mean variance and skewness are provided for, by, uh, provided for each. So they could even be results of, of previous simulations or something like that. The, the input variables can be anything. They don't have to be metalogs. Um, you calculate the mean variance and skewness of the sum as the sum of the respective means, variances, and skewnesses for each variable. Um, that's if they're independent, if they're correlated, then you uh, do what, do these two things, um, as, as I mentioned uh, with the example. And then you convert the mean variance and skewness of the sum to a metalog, and that will give you a metalog that preserves that mean variance and skewness exactly. Uh, and that's the, the guarantee that you are left with uh, so long as it's feasible. All right, I'm gonna do one more, uh, one more example here. And uh, this one is a machine learning example that actually leverages the same method in a different way. Um, this is like for a, uh, think of a, a, a Comcast or a company that has a lot of, of customers and it provides uh, internet services and email services and, and different internet speeds, you know, all kinds of things. And you end up with tables of data that are just like massively complex that you know it'd be it could be thousands and thousands of entries and what do you do with all this stuff well with the emergence of machine learning it's quite natural now to be able to do some kind of a, a of a tree based segmentation to put customers in various uh, groups so some of which uh, you know tenure of the customer could be one um, what kind of contract do they have is it a you know, is a daily contract, monthly contract, annual contract, is there data limits, you know, all those various things. But basically, if you categorize your customers in these different categories, then you can go in with this SPT Metalog method. And suppose you have, you know, data for each of your customers. Well, then you could represent that data on, let's say, the revenues per customer in each of these segments with a three-term Metalog. And whatever is the shape of that data, you pretty much preserve with your three-term metalog, preserve mean variance, skewness, whatever it is. And so you end up with this nice segmentation down below with an easy representation. And then using the method that I just mentioned, if you assume independence or even dependence, you just do whatever you think is appropriate, then, then all of a sudden you could say, well, wait a minute, what's the sum of these two at this level? So if I, if I add these two distributions together, like DSL versus no DSL, what does that look like, right? If I add, if I add all of these down here distribution all together, what does that look like? All the way at the top level, what's my overall distribution of revenue? Now, once I have that, that's quite cool because now I could do things like consider uh, an advertising program or something that would might cause or convert customers to move from one category to the other. And you could measure the effectiveness of that advertising program and you can see some sensitivities on the right hand side here. You could measure the effectiveness of that advertising program and you can compare, well, wait a minute, do I get more value for, um, more value and less risk, okay? for let's say the same amount of cost in an advertising budget, well then clearly you'd wanna do that. And uh, so the point is there are lots of different ways you could use these three term metalogs in ways that you might not, you know, it might not immediately come to mind. Uh, they offer you a lot of flexibility as a tool. I guess that's my key point. And uh, the last key point I wanna make is that um, there's, there's I, I'm gonna make a point about even broader flexibility. Uh, as I mentioned, you've got here quantile parameters in terms of 
uh, you, you've got quantile parameters in terms of coefficients, and you've got coefficients in terms of quantile parameters. It's a closed form relationship either way, and that's for all of these uh, uh, semi-bounded, bounded, bounded uh, metalogs. Well, then, uh, including unbounded, uh, three terms. But a key point that I haven't mentioned, but did, that did come up in our conversation last time, somebody said, well, wait a minute, what about... Um, what what about autocorrelation? What if the parameters, uh, what, what if the shape of my distribution is evolving over time depending on what has happened previously? Another similar question has to do with the multivariate metalogs. What if the outcome, what, what if my probability distribution over, let's say the value of a piece of real estate, for example, is conditional on what happens previously as a uh, movement in the overall real estate market. Well, both of those could be easily modeled by making your, 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 your quantile parameters a function of any other variable you want. They could be a function of time. They could be a function of previous outcomes of previous metalog distributions or even non-metalog distributions. But anyway, by modeling these parameters as evolving according to whatever scale, scalar or vector of other parameters might be relevant, uh, you can extend this system to, uh, to help you with far more complicated problems. And the nice thing about it, what I like about it is that if you keep, for example, your 10, 50, 90 constant, your quantiles constant, then you can just vary, or I'm sorry, your, your percentile triplets, your SPT triplets, you keep those constant, then you can make a nice linear relationship or simple linear relationship of your quantile parameters based on any other variable that is of interest and uh, end up with nice smoothly evolving metalog distributions uh, over time or, uh, uh, or, or, or over conditions on the outcomes of other variables, like the, the, uh, the example of the a value of your particular house or apartment building uh, conditional on how the market came out. Those two, two things are correlated, but they aren't exactly the same because your building could have sort of, uh, features to it that, lead, uh, that uh, provide uncertainty about uh, where it might come out that's independent of market movement. So you need to take both things into account. Anyway, uh, that's, that's, that's the further extension I wanted to offer. Uh, 